Delve into the mysteries of this intriguing island alongside Rick Legina and his team as they unearth ancient coins, meticulously crafted tools, fragments of pottery, and expensive coppers. Each artifact whispers tales of Oak Island's rich history, inviting you to unravel its secrets, one fascinating find at a time. Join us on an adventure to Oak Island, where remarkable discoveries from centuries past await. Just east of the Money Pit on Lot 18, Rick Legina joins heavy equipment operator Billy Gerhardt, metal detection expert Gary Drayton, and Jack Begley. They diligently sift through the dirt mounds known as Dunfield Spoils, left behind when Robert Dunfield excavated a massive hole in 1965. The attempt to uncover the legendary Money Pit treasure vault proved unsuccessful, leaving behind tons of earth untouched for decades. Gary Bradley's recent discovery of a potential relic within these mounds sparked their interest, prompting the group's thorough search for any overlooked valuables. Later this year, they plan to dig their own shafts in the money pit, hoping to unearth crucial evidence to guide their excavation efforts. Rick emphasizes that Dunfield's excavation was not exhaustive, underscoring the importance of combing through the spoils meticulously. As they work, they stumble upon wood fragments along the bank, and Gary's metal detector alerts them to a beeping sound. Their excavation uncovers a large, heavy iron spike, followed by another beeping spot revealing a piece of wood pressed against it. Their astonishment grows when they uncover a massive tree with the persistent beeping sound emanating from within. Recognizing its connection to the money pit, they realize this colossal piece of wood could hold vital information about Oak Island's history, perhaps even confirming the existence of the original treasure shaft Speculation arises that Dunfield might have located the vault's burial place, but was unable to access it in 1965. Billy has asked for one more scoop, and Rick reflects on the significance of their findings, drawing connections to the island's mysterious past. The discovery reassures them that they are indeed exploring the original money pit spoils, yet questions linger about its origins and purpose. Metal detection expert Gary Drayton, accompanied by Jack Begley and heavy equipment operator Billy Gerhardt, persist in their exploration of the spoils excavated from the money pit by Robert Dunfield in 1965. Billy points out some small wood fragments in the bucket, directing attention to a darker wood nestled among the rocks at the bottom. He observes Billy scraping away the rocks to reveal the layer of wood. Jack notices a cut in the wood that appears deliberate. Upon inspection, Billy confirms it as hand-hewn, indicating it was likely crafted manually rather than with mechanized tools, which were not common until the late 18th century. This hand-cut timber holds the potential to be evidence of the original money pit shaft, sparking curiosity about what other secrets might lie within the Dunfield spoils. Billy instructs Jack to explore the opposite end of the area, while Gary descends to detect along the slope, recognizing the spoils extend throughout the site Despite the uncertainty, any discovery, no matter how small, would be significant. Gary's metal detector soon signals a find, a cribbing spike, an iron fastener commonly used to join wooden structures, particularly associated with tunnels or shafts. Its age could be determined through testing, shedding light on the time frame of its use, potentially aligning with the pre-1830s or 1840s era. Gary elaborates on the function of a cribbing spike, emphasizing its relevance to underground constructions like tunnels or shafts. This cribbing spike could indeed be a significant artifact from the original construction of the money pit. Gary carefully stows it away in his pouch and continues his search, eager to uncover further clues. As they excavate a dump, Gary senses a potential signal and urges Billy to hold tight. With precision, Gary unearths a peculiar item that resembles a chisel, he passes it to Laird Niven for examination, prompting Jack to inquire about its purpose. Laird admits it's challenging to determine its exact use, but agrees with Billy's assessment that it appears more suited for finer detailed work rather than rock breaking. Gary suggests that the chisel could be linked to the depositor, marking it as a significant find. Throughout the 226 year history of the Oak Island mystery, numerous enigmatic artifacts, including carved stones, have been discovered both on the surface and buried underground. Among these, the legendary 90-foot stone, unearthed in the Money Pit in 1804, stands out. Adorned with peculiar hieroglyphic symbols reportedly translating to 40 feet below, two million pounds are buried. This greenish-gray slab has fascinated researchers for centuries. While the stone has been missing since the early 1900s, the team speculates that the recently unearthed chisel 
might be the very tool used to carve its cryptic message. Gary plans to have it thoroughly examined, considering it a potential endpoint chisel. Gary's discovery receives praise from the team, underscoring its importance in further unraveling the mysteries of Oak Island's storied past. Terry Matheson and Charles Barkhouse oversee the core drilling operation at the team's latest borehole in the C1 cluster, designated as CD 4.5. Terry queries Adam about their progress, and Adam reports a depth of 78 feet. As they carefully open the clay packets retrieved from the borehole, they make an intriguing discovery, wood fragments. Despite the depth being measured at 78 feet, Charles instructs to mark it as 75 feet, indicating the approximate depth where they encountered the wooden material. Transitioning from dense clay to what appears to be beams or timber hints at a potential in-place structure, a finding that could hold significant implications. This discovery aligns with a previous borehole drilled 15 feet deeper, suggesting the possibility of encountering yet another man-made structure. The tantalizing prospect arises. Could this lead to the elusive source of silver and gold that the team has been seeking? Excitedly, Terry and Charles present their findings to Scott, who immediately begins scanning the wooden material for any traces of metal. Suddenly, amidst the scanning process, they stumble upon a small metal object, further adding to the evidence of a wooden tunnel at approximately 75 feet deep in borehole CD 4.5. The team's interest intensifies as they continue to uncover wood fragments and pieces of metal in the C1 cluster area, particularly intriguing given the absence of any historical records of prior work in this vicinity. Rick Lagina is promptly notified of these new and potentially significant discoveries, arriving to inspect them firsthand and receive a comprehensive report from Kelly. Kelly elaborates on the findings in CD 4.5 detailing the presence of wood fragments at around 74 and 75 feet, along with the discovery of a metal chunk at 75 and a half feet. Despite being encrusted and challenging to identify, the metal object carries substantial weight, presenting yet another mystery for the team to unravel. Discovering evidence of a tunnel, along with metal, at a depth of 75 feet in the Money Pit area, sparks hope among the team that they may be on the verge of a significant breakthrough. Just three weeks prior, while drilling in borehole D2, located a mere 13 and a half feet southwest and at a depth of approximately 90 feet, they uncovered yet another wooden tunnel dating back to 1488, along with a mysterious metal object containing a substantial amount of gold. The possibility arises that both of these tunnels could be connected to the original money pit, further fueling their excitement and anticipation. Rick expresses his intention to take the latest discovery to the archaeology trailer for further analysis, specifically mentioning the use of XRF, X-ray fluorescence spectrometer technology. Later that afternoon, Rick and Charles convene with Rick's brother Marty and professional conservator Kelly Barassa at the archaeology trailer to discuss their findings. Charles reveals another piece of metal, prompting Rick to ponder its presence at a depth of 75 and a half feet given that the known tunnel horizon ranges from 86 to 93 feet. Kelly observes that the metal appears cemented on the surface, making cleaning difficult, but he assures them that it can still be tested using the XRF. Utilizing the XRF, Kelly performs a chemical analysis of the encrusted metal object. The device emits non-destructive radiation to identify the elemental composition of metal items. Upon testing, it is determined that the metal is primarily iron, which is expected but notably contains traces of gold, eliciting jubilation among the team. This revelation adds another layer of intrigue to their ongoing exploration and reinforces their determination to unlock the mysteries of Oak Island. As another exciting day dawns on Oak Island, brothers Rick and Marty Legina, along with their partner Craig Tester and members of their team, are conducting a strategic drilling operation in the Money Pit area that they hope will help them solve a 226 year old mystery. They use an XRF to analyze two samples, and the results show gold, with an extremely high percentage of 700 parts per million. One week ago, after discovering wood from a depth of 88 feet in borehole D2, which was then carbon dated to as early as 1488, the team unearthed a mysterious piece of metal. It's a significant chunk of metal. When geoscientist Dr. Ian Spooner performed elemental analysis on it, using an X-ray fluorescence device. Rick and members of the team were astonished by what they had found. It was a piece of metal that may have been either in close contact with gold 
or even more interestingly, the metals themselves contain gold. To Rick, if it's part of the metal, that's far more interesting, as it means it's a valuable item. Based in an area known as the C1 Cluster, where recent water tests in existing boreholes have revealed high levels of silver and gold, the team has designed a strategic drilling grid in the hopes of pinpointing the fabled Money Pit Treasure Vault. Now the next target on that grid is Borehole B4, which sits just 14 feet from D2. The C1 Cluster sounds like the right spot. Gold on the steel is very encouraging if it's accurate, and if the gold is on the metal and there are no natural sources, then Marty says they're closing in on the treasure. Terry claims they are here on B4, but this hole in particular is at the northern perimeter or edge of the C1 cluster of tunnels. If they find evidence of tunnels there, they go now they have something more to chase. It is also in this area that the team has previously drilled into a believed tunnel at a depth of approximately 90 feet. If the team is unsuccessful in finding treasure in B4, then they hope to hit a tunnel that will lead them to it and they have to concentrate on the areas where they do know there are possible tunnels and zero in on that. Rick was joyful upon hearing the information as they hoped that they might be very close to something. A new year of searching for a legendary treasure is about to begin on Oak Island. But for brothers Rick and Marty Legina, their partner Craig Tester, and their team, they are starting out with an assurance that no one before them has had since this mystery began back in 1795. They are all excited about the evidence of silver last year. Gary thinks it's fantastic. Just before the team ended their search operations last year, geoscientist Dr. Ian Spooner conducted water sampling tests in a number of previously drilled boreholes across the Money Pit area. The results were astonishing. There was every reason to believe down in those holes that there is a very large amount of silver. It was almost a Gearhart truck of silver. This year is gonna be really significant. Rick addresses that it was a phenomenally successful year last year. For instance, last year they found all kinds of dramatic things, and this is the first year they've had direct indications of precious metals, and by that, Marty means they have silver, silver dissolved in the water which screams of treasure. Rick thinks they are closer than ever to furthering their understanding of what may have happened here. They all meet at the warehouse where Rick orders Doug to get everybody on the screen up, and they'll see if they can't get this. Due to important business back in Traverse City, Michigan, Marty Legina and his son Alex must wait before they can travel to Nova Scotia and join the team in person. Ian Spooner claims however you cut it, there's silver there. It's in wells in the Money Pit area, and it's not just a little silver to create an anomaly in groundwater. It's a fair bit of silver. They identified a lab that can take a look not only at their water samples from the perspective of silver, but they can also take a look at their water samples from the perspective of gold. It's something new. It's a lab in Queens, Ontario, and they specialize in looking at groundwater and exploration for gold mines. Marty wants to look for this gold as soon as possible, as they've been looking for gold for 10 years now. They're going to act on that as soon as possible, and they're just going to need everybody's help deciding where to sample. In order to pinpoint the exact location of precious metals buried deep in the money pit, Dr. Spooner will take water samples from over 30 boreholes throughout the area, strategically chosen based on last year's findings. Then, using cutting-edge mineral analysis, the team will be able to identify not only the areas with the highest concentration of silver, but also any presence of gold. This is not just about chasing the gold and silver, it's about locating where the gold and silver are. And the only way Rick thinks to do that is testing further water samples from this area where these trace elements are coming up. Marty asks about putting down big cans. Rick claims they have reached out to Irving for a quote, and the quote is for a 10-foot can. Once the upcoming water tests are completed, the Leginas and their team will drill up to 20 new 6-inch boreholes in the areas that reveal any evidence of silver and hopefully gold. Based on those findings, they will conduct their biggest and most expensive dig to date by excavating a series of 10-foot wide steel-cased shafts to depths of as much as 200 feet. The caisson size came down as simple math. A 10-foot can over an 8-foot can represents 40% more material to search through. Last year, the team uncovered a massive stone road or possible ship's wharf in the southeastern corner of the swamp. Further investigation revealed a separate cobblestone pathway extending up the swamp's eastern border and continuing to an as yet undetermined destination on the island. It was along this stone path that the team also found pieces of 15th century keg barrels, iron ring bolts possibly utilized as part of a pulley system, and a trade weight. 
an ancient tool typically used for the measurement of gold and silver coins. But who built these features remains burning questions for Rick, Marty, and the team. Rick states that the sole purpose of everything associated with the stone path is to find out where it goes. If you're offloading something from a ship, you're going to need a stone path or a road to carry something inland. He was interested in going back to the stone path. He asks about some background about CCH's renewed interest and what the permitting process will be. The Department of Community Culture and Heritage, who oversees archaeology in Nova Scotia, has suddenly set up and taken notice. They wanted more control over any search or past human activities, so they're not going to be able to operate the way they did in previous years. In previous years, the island was divided into two parts, the Western Drumlin for which they needed regular archaeological permits, and the Eastern Drumlin for which they needed no permits. The Department of Community Culture and Heritage decided to rescind all of that, except for that small area around the money pit, and now requires permits for any work done and to monitor the excavation work. So they want more formal tests and excavation done by hand and everything screened, just like they would on a normal archaeological site. When they first started on this quest on Oak Island, with the original treasure trove license that they had, there was very little extra permission they needed. There has been a gradually increasing level of scrutiny, oversight, and regulations since that time, and Marty thinks it's because of their efforts. They've proven that this place has some real historical value. They believe the government said that they'll work with them. Rick Legina, accompanied by metal detection expert Gary Drayton and archaeologist Laird Niven, arrives with anticipation on Lot 5, situated on the western side of Oak Island. As they remove the sign, the realization dawns upon them that they are now tasked with continuing the work started by Robert. Rick is filled with excitement, thrilled at the prospect of finally being able to excavate on a lot that has long held the promise of answers. With eager anticipation, they venture into the first designated area, where Gary's metal detector signals a significant presence at the center. Upon digging, they uncover a survey marker bearing the warning, don't dig on top of it. Undeterred by the cautionary message, they press on with their exploration of Lot 5. Reflecting on Robert Young's exhaustive efforts on his property, particularly his collaboration with Fred Nolan, Rick acknowledges that while Robert lacked the advanced equipment at Gary's disposal, there may still be hidden treasures awaiting discovery on Lot 5. Moving to the second designated area, they encounter a promising signal. As they dig, they unearth a rock blocking their path, but their perseverance pays off when both Gary and Rick uncover a coin appearing to be a cut coin. Speculating on its origin, they suggest that such coins might have been fragmented for use as small change, yet this particular find is remarkable in its beauty. Gary identifies it as an amid coin, hinting at its potential, dating back to the first millennium BC. The concept of hammered coinage, dating back to the first millennium BC, emerges as Laird provides insight into the coin's creation process. Hammered coinage, one of the earliest methods of producing metal currency in human history, involved placing a small, blank piece of metal between two patterned surfaces, or dies. Through repeated hammering, the dies would imprint the coin with intricate designs or assign value, shaping the course of ancient economies and civilizations. The significance of this discovery lies in the fact that the coin's creation process predates the invention of machines in Europe during the 15th century, potentially making it over 500 years old. Gary expresses his excitement, noting that such a find is typically associated with European discoveries adding to its uniqueness. Dubbed a top pocket find, Gary suggests immediate analysis back at the lab to unravel its secrets. Rick and Gary waste no time and promptly bring the coin to the Interpretive Center for examination by archaeologist Laird Niven and archaeometallurgy Emma Culligan. Laird's positive reaction to their find boosts their optimism as Gary presents the coin to him. Laird identifies it as a cut coin with a striking patina, although they're unable to discern whether it's made of copper or silver. Opting for further analysis, they utilize X-ray fluorescence spectrometry XRF, to determine its metal composition. Emma's analysis reveals primarily copper, with traces of tin, iron, and a small amount of arsenic. Rick queries whether it could be arsenical bronze, a hypothesis confirmed by Emma who places it within the context of arsenical bronze artifacts from the 1500s. Notably, arsenical bronze is not typically found beyond a certain historical period, and coins of this size are commonly associated with the pre-16th century era. The mention of another arsenical bronze discovery on Lot 7, in close proximity to Lot 5, adds another layer of intrigue. 
Just two months prior, Gary and Jack Begley unearthed a barter token containing arsenical bronze, further suggesting a potential pre-16th century origin. As the team contemplates the implications of these findings, they realize they may be piecing together a crucial aspect of the Oak Island mystery. With evidence pointing to the 1500s, a rich narrative begins to emerge, adding depth to their exploration. The revelation that both Lot 5 and Lot 7 are yielding esoteric metals fuels their determination to uncover the underlying reasons behind these discoveries. The team recognizes the importance of delving deeper into these findings to unlock the secrets of Oak Island's enigmatic past. Rick has teamed up with metal detection expert Gary Drayton on Lot 5, situated in the heart of Oak Island. Having recently acquired the lot just two weeks ago, Rick, Marty, Craig, and the team have already unearthed a series of remarkable discoveries, including ancient tools and a musket ball that may predate the 16th century. Among their finds is a hand-forged half-coin, possibly one of the oldest ever found on Oak Island. Arriving at the first flag site, Rick and Gary are greeted by a promising beep from their metal detector. Having flagged several targets earlier that morning, Gary now has the go-ahead from archaeologist Laird Niven to excavate them. Another strong signal leads them to uncover a thick, heavy object resembling a blade-like tool. This discovery raises the question, could Rick and Gary be uncovering further evidence of human activity on Lot 5, predating the discovery of the money pit? If so, who were these individuals? And what were they doing in the middle of Oak Island? The find is deemed a perfect candidate for XRF analysis. Continuing their exploration, they detect another flagged area where they stumble upon a small piece of glazed pottery. Their search yields larger fragments of pottery, a noteworthy find given its unfamiliar style to Gary. Meanwhile, on Lot 5's western side, archaeologists Laird Niven and Helen Sheldon, along with Craig Tester, join Rick, Marty, and Gary to inspect the potentially significant discoveries. Gary expresses his belief that they have not encountered this style of pottery before, adding to the intrigue surrounding their findings on Lot 5. As they piece together the puzzle of Oak Island's history, each discovery brings them closer to unraveling its mysteries. Helen Sheldon observes that the pottery exhibits a series of standard designs characteristic of press molding, a technique that began around 1740. The ceramic type itself dates back to the 1720s, indicating 18th century English pottery, predating the discovery of the money pit by over 50 years. This discovery adds weight to the possibility of an 18th century British military presence on Oak Island, raising questions about their connection to the 228-year-old mystery. Could they have been searching for something buried centuries earlier, or perhaps guarding a significant site? Miriam Amaralt joins archaeologists Laird Niven and Helen Sheldon on Lot 5 to investigate an area where several 18th century British artifacts were unearthed just a day ago. They come across what appears to be a rock-filled feature, potentially predating the Money Pit's discovery. This discovery hints at the possibility of uncovering something substantial and important. Miriam's find of delicate Delftware, dating to the mid-1700s and of English origin, further reinforces the notion of an earlier occupation on Oak Island. Additionally, Helen discovers a peculiar copper nail, hand-forged and heavy-duty, with a distinctive rose head. Given the Oak Island team's history of uncovering ship-related artifacts ranging from the 18th century to as early as the 3rd century AD, Laird Niven speculates about the significance of Lot 5. Whether historically significant or relevant to their treasure hunt, Lot 5 holds immense importance for the team. Any discovery on Lot 5, especially anything predating previous deposits, is of exceptional interest. With many clues still awaiting discovery beneath the surface of Lot 5, the team remains committed to unraveling its mysteries and uncovering the secrets hidden within Oak Island's soil. Rick Legina and Gary Drayton are exploring an area where they've made groundbreaking discoveries among the oldest documented on Oak Island and in North America. Recently, alongside Marty, Craig Tester, and Gary, they uncovered four ancient coins, bringing the total to five within a year. Remarkably, numismatist Sandy Campbell determined three of these coins to be of Roman origin, dating between 500 AD and 300 BC. Rick highlights Lot 5's mysterious nature with puzzling man-made structures and artifact finds. During their exploration, Rick discovers a strap-like object potentially from a box or chest, hinting at further mysteries. They speculate if it's related to a nearby circular depression, 
or the Roman coins found in the area. They plan to use a CT scanner for a clearer view and hope Emma's analysis will shed light on Lot 5's secrets. Continuing their search, they uncover a chunk of iron, possibly a rosette-type fastener, near Lot 5's prominent feature. Rick questions why iron pieces are found in areas with significant discoveries, given its value as a resource. The next day, Rick and the team consult blacksmithing expert Carmen Lega at the Oak Island Interpretive Center. Rick presents a collection of artifacts recovered from Lot 5 to Carmen for examination. Gary mentions a chunky iron piece found on Lot 5. Feeling its age due to its weight and speculating it could be a broken tool or fastener. Upon scanning, Carmen identifies it as possibly a chisel, likely used for mining or tunneling, but not long enough for its intended purpose. Rick asks about the metallurgy, revealing no modern elements and indicating an older metal composition with potassium and calcium. Carmen also examines a decorative strap resembling a bow tie, suggesting it was used to adorn chests or wooden boxes, indicating a French cultural influence. This finding raises questions about the presence of French artifacts predating the 17th century on Oak Island and their connection to the lead cross, which testing indicated originated from southern France. The artifact's proximity to a location marked on the Xena map, believed to be associated with the Knights Templar and Freemasons, adds intrigue to the mystery. Rick reflects on Xena Halpern's theory that Oak Island was visited by Templars and Freemasons to hide sacred valuables, considering the artifacts found as potential evidence. He believes the original depositional work on Oak Island began very early and aims to fill in the gaps more precisely. The unique artifacts discovered on Oak Island, some of which Rick hasn't seen elsewhere, prompt further analysis and exploration. Gary expresses eagerness to return to Lot 5 for more discoveries, and the team appreciates Carmen's insights and efforts in unraveling Oak Island's mysteries. At the southern border of Oak Island Swamp, Marty Legina and Craig Tester, alongside Rick Legina and the team, inspect a recently unearthed wooden structure beneath the stone road. Two logs underneath appear fitted together, resembling a cabin's construction. Brush and smaller logs support the structure, abruptly stopping. Beneath the stone road lies swamp muck mingled with larger logs, perpendicular to the road's direction, indicating its integration into the stone road's construction. Marty believes the road's purpose was to remain hidden after completion, possibly leading to the treasure. Notably, the team discovered significant artifacts, including a 16th century hand-wrought chain and hook, while excavating the road's southern edge two weeks prior. Yes, it's possible that the artifact was once used in the swamp area to offload cargo from a ship onto Oak Island. The hand-forged chain, possibly a three-point hitch, could have been utilized for loading or unloading heavy items. Rick's observation of a stable surface nearby suggests a potential area for this activity. Using a three-point hitch, cargo could have been pulled across the heavy ground and then up the road. Rick considers this discovery significant as it helps define the road's construction and its transition to the beach. Yes, the discovery of the barrel stave near the stone road or ship's wharf aligns with the possibility that it's related to the pieces of wooden cargo barrels previously unearthed in the area, which Carmen Lega estimated could be up to 600 years old. Gary's detection of the barrel stave suggests a potential connection to the older artifacts found in the swamp. The continuous discoveries during excavation indicate the significance of the area, prompting the team to continue digging and conduct further analysis. As Billy excavates and encounters a boulder, it raises questions about whether it signifies the end of the road or if further investigation is warranted through additional shovel work. As Gary and Marty explore the area near the boulder, they speculate about its significance, considering whether it indicates a road alignment with the stone road. Marty reflects on the impressive scale of the construction and its likely purpose, emphasizing the importance of uncovering further data through continued excavation. He instructs Billy to search for additional boulders or clues. The possibility of discovering ancient artifacts in the swamp excites the team, and Gary's discovery of three intriguing pieces of wood, including two strips and what appears to be a handle, adds to their anticipation and the potential for significant findings. The peculiar piece of wood prompts Gary to speculate if it could have been part of an old pickaxe or axe, perhaps used in the original construction of the stone road. 
Scientific analysis might reveal not only its age, but also clues about its origin. As Billy notes the presence of more rocks, Marty suggests there may be buried clues in the swamp, despite his initial skepticism about its significance. Over time, Marty's perspective has shifted, recognizing the swamp's potential for discoveries. Rick's arrival underscores the potential importance of the findings, indicating they may be on the brink of significant revelations. A new day begins on Oak Island, filled with excitement and anticipation for Rick and Marty Legina and their team expert Blaine Carr, embark on a two-step operation in the Money Pit area, aiming to solve a 208-year-old treasure mystery. Carr plans to explore a cave at 140 to 142 feet, hoping to find treasure and determine its origin. They seek evidence of human influence, potential entrances and exits, focusing on tunnels, vaults and anomalies indicating treasure. A recent report by ID and Technologies highlighted multiple potential targets based on data collected over two years using muon detectors. Now, after drilling into Aladdin's cave, they'll start with a high-definition camera investigation to assess its origin and contents. If successful, Blaine will conduct a comprehensive sonar scan to map the feature in detail. Rick suggests running the camera down first to potentially identify features useful for the 3D mapping sonar. Progressing, they approach the water, indicating they're near the cave's entrance. They locate the caisson's edge and notice a cavity as they move deeper. Despite the possibility of silt covering additional features, they aim to explore beneath a ledge. With cautious adjustments, they confirm an open area suitable for mapping. The exploration of Aladdin's cave is engrossing and holds potential for further discoveries. As they lower the camera and rotate it, visibility improves, providing a clearer view than before, crucial for determining the cave's depth and features accurately. An angular shape protrudes to the right, prompting scrutiny to discern if it's man-made. Marty speculates it could hold the treasure, potentially answering many questions. Following recent video footage of possible man-made structures in Aladdin's cave, they use a sonar device to determine its dimensions and locate tunnels. The Echologger DAS-710 emits high-intensity radar pulses, reflecting off objects to create a 3D map. Data collection progresses, outlining the cavity's perimeter. They plan to review the results the next morning. Assembled eagerly, they view Blaine Carr's presentation, observing a straight-down view of the cave, transitioning into a 3D image with prominent yellow-green hues. The sonar depicts a downward slope, with darker red indicating the wall between them and the cavern floor. Despite efforts, they cannot see the bottom due to the wall's obstruction. However, they notice a blue line crossing what appears to be two gaps, suggesting a potential opening. Blaine suggests the possibility of man-made ingress into a natural cavern. When asked about the cavity's size, he admits uncertainty due to the sloping terrain, which varies and inclines about 30 degrees. Nonetheless, gravity would likely lead any objects to the bottom of the slope. Marty believes the possibility of treasure is promising. Rick finds the concept of a cave within a cave intriguing, particularly if they discover man-made features hinting at a potential treasure chamber. Blaine suggests moving over and drilling another hole, five to six feet away, to provide the sonar with a clearer view of the area, determining whether they're in an isolated cavern or an opening. Rick agrees, emphasizing the need for a fresh perspective. Marty affirms their collective agreement on the importance of gathering more data. As the day ends on Oak Island, the team talks about all the cool stuff they found. They're super excited. They're wondering, what stories do these old coins have? And how did people use those old tools? And what about those pieces of pottery? What do they tell us? And those weird copper nails, what's up with them? They're really curious about everything they found. Can't wait to see what we discover next time. Don't forget to subscribe and like our channel for more adventures on Oak Island.